Hi everyone and welcome to our next segment of Moments with Mumila. I have the lovely Cindy Blackstock here with me. I'm super excited for our conversations today. And of course, as always, before we get started, the purpose of these conversations is to share Indigenous perspectives, experiences and thoughts. These perspectives are not my own. I am looking to create awareness and support discussion amongst Indigenous peoples ourselves and among Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples outside of these Zoom segments. So again, I have a very wonderful guest here with me today. And Cindy, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Yeah, thank you. And I join you from unceded Algonquin territory here in Ottawa. Uh, my name is Cindy Blackstock and I have here Spirit Bear, who represents First Nations children who are uh, working together for justice along with other children in the country to deal with the contemporary inequities of First Nations kids. Now, I grew up in the bush of Northern British Columbia uh, in the 1960s and 70s, and really saw both racism come to the kind of come to the surface in ways where uh, your life as a First Nations girl was really capped at growing up to, according to society, to become a drunken Indian or uh, to grow up to be on welfare, and that was the tone of society back then. That idea of uh, the that took away your humanity, it took away your dreams, and it trumped what you and your people could become and who you were. Um, and so that really fueled in me a, an idea of two things. One is that I really saw First Nations children as being sacred and valuable in their own right, and that humanity needed to be recognized and restored. And the second thing is I started to see all the systemic discrimination I didn't have words for it back then, but you could see it in the way that people were being treated because they were First Nations. The reserve system, for example, the idea of the status cards, all of that were markers that were to dehumanize you and make you less than others. And so that really put me on a track of looking at, well, you know, how can we ensure that a generation of First Nations kids don't have to recover from their childhoods? How can we ensure that they walk with their heads up, proud of who they are and the distinct cultures they come from? Uh, and when I use the word First Nations, I want people to really emphasize on the S because there's such distinctions amongst First Nations. Like I grew up on the West Coast. I've never seen a powwow or a smudge until I was in my 30s. That was totally different for us or the medicine wheel didn't know what it was. Um, and so there are very distinct differences among these communities, different languages, and even within communities, we have different perspectives. And so I don't want to homogenize by using that word, but there are some things that are common to our experience. And so now I work on First Nations children's culturally based equity, just trying to make sure that First Nations children and their families get an equitable chance to grow up uh, proud of who they are, to grow up safely in their families, get a good education and be healthy. Absolutely. And so many important things I want to touch on there. It's just a matter, I guess, of, of where to start. And absolutely having the S, First Nations. And I'm, I'm so picky about how we talk and, and, and language and what words we decide to use. Indigenous peoples, that S is so important because we are not necessarily a collective group. Uh, we are not all the same. We don't share the same perspectives and culture, even within within First Nations groups, within Inuit, like there are such a variety, if you will, and, and even saying that sounded weird coming out of my mouth. There are such uh, differences even amongst Indigenous peoples ourselves, and that's perfectly fine. But quite often what we see is that we're all kind of categorized in, into that box. And before we get into, into that conversation, I wanted to know what Spirit Bear has on there. Oh, okay. Spirit Bear is well, wearing. Spirit Bear is, uh, was gifted to us by the Carrier Secondy Tribal Council when we filed a human rights case against the Canadian government for their underfunding of First Nations Children's Services. And we wanted something in the room that reminded us why we were there, and that was children. So we put Spirit Bear there, but back in the day, he didn't have this wonderful outfit. Um, but uh, one of the groups that started coming to the hearings were children. 
And they would leave letters for Spirit Bear. They would take Spirit Bear and hold on to him. And eventually he started to get gifted clothes and regalia by the community members. And so you can see here he has his own ribbon shirt. That's very beautiful, right? And um, he has a TRC button here and it's on a uh, moose hide heart. Now moose hide campaign is to end domestic violence in uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities. And it's in the shape of a heart because Spirit Bearer works with children on something called Have a Heart Day where they send letters to the Prime Minister about ending the inequalities First Nations kids face. And Senator Sinclair gave him this very special TRC button since he's part of the TRC's calls to, uh, calls to action. And this is beautiful. This is a turtle, beaded turtle. It was gifted to him by a community in Manitoba. And these are his uh, beautiful cedar moccasins. And uh, they were gifted by a family in British Columbia. But he actually has a whole wardrobe now. Uh, yeah, and I literally, I'm going to change my computer so you can actually see what I say is real. Wow. Uh, and it's uh, gifts of children and letters. And um, that's why Spirit Bear is so special, is he really represents the spirit and the love of children. And um, that's why he's been our ambassador to really bring the message to all children that we need to stand together when people are being treated unjustly. Uh, when there's, a, you know, we see First Nations kids getting less because of who they are or not being honored for who they are. Um, we all need to stand together against that because difference isn't something to be afraid of. It's to be celebrated. And I always say difference is not, that's why I won't use the words difference, overcome difference. I don't like that. It's a celebration of difference. Absolutely. It's an understanding that we don't have to all be the same. We, we, we honor and respect each other and take real pleasure in understanding that rich diversity of human experience and human perspectives. That's, that's, the, that's the richness, the heartbeat of humanity. And I think that there, there are so, uh, children and youth are such, I'm not supposed to have favorites as a member, but definitely <laughs> youth have the number one spot in my heart. I love working with Northern Youth Abroad. I love working with youth. And, and speaking of, of children and uh, activism, can you walk us through how your activism and and even that i think that a common theme for us is going to be the, the way that we talk and the language that we decide to use because i i think that often people like us label us as activists and <laughs> it's it's such an odd word because what we're fighting for is equality oftentimes basic human rights, trying to justify why our lives as Indigenous peoples should be treated equally and deserve to be treated equally. So I find that activism is such a weird word because we're fighting for equality. We're fighting for human rights. We're fighting for, for children. And I think that sometimes the word activism can totally miss that mark because you can advocate for a number of things and you can advocate for a number of issues. Why are we advocating for basic human rights and, and equality here in Canada? So before we really, really dive into that conversation, uh, why, why children? Why, why do you choose that as, as your focus? Because I believe in children. We, uh, ev with every new generation comes a chance to create a society anew. And it's really from the teachings of elders, right? Um, elders, uh, I remember Reg Crochu from the Blackfoot Nation. Uh, he said that in their teachings, children are taught everything that's important to be a, of a good mind in relation to one another and in relation to the world by the ancestors. And that babbling is a language of the ancestors. And he said, really for adults, we need to learn, remember how to babble. Uh, that's what babies gift us, is that remembering how to babble and what babble means. He says they'll learn to walk on their own. 
We don't need to teach them that. The gift they have is that sacredness. And I see it when, as children develop. You know, when you think about two-year-olds, they understand fairness at the age of two. And so that fairness is something we have a possibility of nurturing in them so that they don't learn our best, bad lessons of discrimination and of uh, trying to have power over others. We can really learn from children, be reminded what fairness is really like, be reminded what love is like, you know? Children are no love, right? They just, their first act when they're babies is to reach out, right? <laughs> um, and they, they remind us of the sacredness of love and how that has to be the foundation of a good mind and, and a good life. And uh, so I think with children, if we're able to really harness their gifts as children and use them as teachers, as adults, to remind us about what's important and treat all children as knowledge holders. So teach them what is happening not now and then equip them with loving, peaceful, but effective tools to address those injustices. Then together they can grow up uh, with a different understanding of one another and be better equipped to tackle the social justice challenges that not only happen for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, but happen for other groups around the world as well. Absolutely, and children are such a, I was thinking of my, my nephew when you were saying that, and even in, in culture and when you look historically, what was normal for even indigenous groups amongst ourselves was different, but the ideas that the federal government had of what should and what should be, I don't know if normal is the right word, but what how things should be, if you will, um, is something that is, is very, and can be very different from culture, our cultures and the, we have such differences sometimes in our culture. And I think that that's something that Canadians don't really have a full grasp on if you haven't lived it or you're not a part of a family or community that has had that historic violent relationship with institutions like the federal government, like the RCMP. And what people don't realize is that this is not something that happened hundreds of years ago. It's not something that happened even a hundred years ago. Yes, it was started at the time, um, but the way I try and explain uh, Inuit history, at least in Canada, is that it was a pack of punched couple decades between the 1950s and the 1970s or so. These are not our great, great grandfathers, our great, great, great grandfathers. These are our great grandparents these are our grandparents these are our parents these are people who raised us these are cycles that unfortunately sometimes are still continuing and okay i'm gonna take it back just a step can you talk a little bit to you had mentioned you hadn't heard, hadn't been to a powwow or uh, i believe a sweat lodge uh, until you were older it wasn't the norm in in your culture can you talk a little bit about um different first nations sorry the first nations group that you're a part of and some of those misconceptions and assumptions and stereotypes that being a First Nations individual oftentimes comes along with here in Canada. Yeah, so I'm a member of the Gitsan First Nation and uh, our community is along the Skeena River in northern British Columbia. So, um, and it was interesting, in 1969, uh, the members of our nation actually created a cultural village called Kisan, K-S-A-N. And what that was meant is to teach the non-Indigenous population about our culture, to try and address that racism um, as part of that, that unfolding. So we have, uh, if you were to walk into one of our villages, we have the feast houses, we have the totem poles, we have the button blankets, uh, but those are just symbols of a value system and way of life that goes back tens of thousands of years. We were not nomadic in our community. So as a result of that, really, we, were, we lived in a pretty defined space. We absolutely had respectful relations with our neighboring First Nations. Often they spoke either different dialects of our language or different languages entirely. 
So it wasn't unusual for members of our community to be multilingual, right? Uh, to have relations with these other communities around economic issues, around political issues, uh, around a whole host of matters. Um, so that's the way it was. But we um, started to see colonialism really in the late 1800s as the gold panners started coming up through our territory uh, to get gold for gold and resources and had suffered serious losses due to the introduction of disease. And then residential schools. And you were talking earlier about these Western views, right? You know, um, they would literally come into the community. And sometimes if you were a mom or dad, you were off doing something and they would take your kids, you wouldn't even know they were gone. And in our case, they were often sent to res Edmonton Residential School or to Port Alberni Residential School, two very abusive residential schools. And those children were removed and put in those schools, allegedly to be educated. Um, but there was another assumption too, and that is that they would be properly cared for. And no one ever questioned, you know, there were all eyes on the community when they were raising their children. But as soon as they were removed, there was an assumption that these people were properly caring for them. When in fact, many children in those schools died, many, many were abused. And there was no kind of attention to that question of whether or not the federal government was keeping up its promise of properly caring for these children. So those schools in, in British Columbia started to close in the 80s and 90s. But the outcomes of that residential school, the trauma from having generation after generation of children removed from the community. And the other side of it was adults in a community growing up in a community where there were no kids, right? Imagine what that feels like, right? So you have this weird, horrible experiment happening on First Nations folks. And then we emerge out of that thanks to the multi-generational strength that we have. I try to avoid the word healing because I think that defines a people that's only identities recovering from illness. And I think our multi-generational strength is far stronger than the unbelievable levels of trauma we've experienced. And it's also what we need to leverage to go forward. So coming out of that now, uh, there has been a real effort to try and restore language, to restore culture, to restore people to a level of, of dignified living where they can grow up in a way that their ancestors would have dreamt for them. But also within a modern context, right? Uh, people sometimes think our cultures are frozen, right? And it's like frozen back there. And if you kind of continue through time, somehow things don't, don't evolve. But I think that's, that's garbage, to be honest. I think our peoples were always smart. They always had to evolve to changing conditions. The key is that they had key values and beliefs that guided them very much like a very important compass as they dealt with the changing world. Absolutely. And I think the multi-generational -gener aspect is something that is so important. And even the way we talk about our, our history and our different histories, it's, and, and, there are so many things that intertwine into the current day that we are in, uh, into 2020. And I think that one aspect is, and, and a conversation that we are seeing more and more is culture appropriation. And people having a really hard time being able to grasp that. And I think when when you look historically, it's really hard to, have those discussions and again justifying reasoning and it's could you imagine not wearing who you are not being able to keep your hair not being able to wear what are normal clothes to you to live in a, a house or a home that has multiple generations is something that is so normal um, for for Inuit anyways and and was uh, until colonization until we saw that that relationship if you can even call it that between indigenous peoples and the federal government can you talk a little bit more to how do i say this to bigger court whether they're court cases or um, 
protests or bigger experiences that you have seen within your lifetime? I'm thinking about things like, um, you know, we saw, for example, when Colton Bushy was was killed. We saw when Tina Fontaine was killed. We saw those conversations starting to to spark, but unfortunately not get us, I think, to the point where we need to. I think we have this idea that we love to talk about reconciliation. And as Canadians, we love to think we are nice and accepting and diverse and inclusive when Canadian history and current day for Indigenous peoples, no, sorry, I shouldn't say that. For Indigenous peoples, that is part of Canadian history. This is not just our history, it is Canadian history as well. Um, that I don't think we're at truth yet. We're not, we haven't talked about the facts. We haven't talked about the injustices. And I think that in turn has continued to create this divisiveness of Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous peoples. Because oftentimes when we have a disagreement or have a debate or whatever it may be, oftentimes what it is is simply lack of knowledge of understanding the history and the situation so sorry for all that i was starting to go uh, ramble there um for all that w can you talk to some of the i i would use the word historic um experiences that you've been a part of or that you have seen um so far well, one of the things growing up is, uh, like, I grew up off reserve in the bush, and we would go to the reserve on occasion, right? Um, and I would see a lot of disadvantage. Uh, a lot of things were just harder on reserve, right? Uh, especially back then, because residential schools, we have to remember, were still operating. But I didn't really understand why. Sorry, there. Can sorry. Just okay. so we're clear, you're talking about when residential school was still operating. Well, I know it's still operating. So when I think about back in the 60s and 70s when it was still operating, life was really hard. And then when residential school stopped, though, what I really started to appreciate that discrimination is not only what you see in terms of offensive language or something like the Indian Act, which is still with us as a piece of legislation that categorizes who's status and non-status people. I mean, you can't get more racist than that. But it's also in what becomes normal. And discrimination is most dangerous, I think, when it becomes normalized, and especially when it's perpetrated by the state. And it even becomes normalized amongst those who are experiencing the discrimination. Let me give you the example. So on reserve, the federal government funds public services. Versus for others, it's done via the territorial or provincial government. Now, since confederation the federal government has underfunded all those services and that's why we see things like so many boil water advisories people think well how is it possible you can't turn on your tap and get a clean glass of water in canada of all places uh, that's why we see the underfunding of education in first nations communities of health care of child welfare and all of those inequalities pile up on the hopes and dreams of first nations kids so when um, I started doing child welfare, which is about now 30 years ago, we saw the symptoms of that, but people didn't uh, do what my mom says, which is when you come across a complex problem, look for the obvious because almost no one does, right? No one was looking at, well, if we put any family in these conditions, cut all of their services by 30 to 50% that they and their families rely on, and then introduce the multi-generational trauma of colonialism in residential school. How well would they be doing, right? And it seemed to me to be obvious that we needed to deal with this. Um, but, and it also, I was kind of naive back then. I, I thought if we showed the federal government along with the experience of many other uh, very talented and wise First Nations folks from across the country, if we showed them what the problem was with their discrimination and showed them the consequences of the, what happens for kids, and then more importantly, work with them to come up with a solution, they'd fix it. I mean, how can you, could anyone racially discriminate against kids, right? And so I went down that narrative for about 10 years, and that was a big mistake for me, 
Because had I looked back on the previous 100 years of history, I would have seen report after report. First Nations are getting less. The government acknowledges that. They know it's leading to the deaths and harms of kids, and they're not doing anything about it. So in 2007, we finally filed the human rights complaint along with the Assembly of First Nations again, uh, against Canada, saying that their underfunding is racial discrimination against at least 165,000 kids. And even then I was naive. I thought, we're gonna file it and they're gonna come to their senses. But no, they fought tooth and nail on jurisdictional grounds. And even when they lost that case in 2016, so this is under the Trudeau government now, they ex accepted the, uh, the decision and then they didn't implement it. So it's now been 10 non-compliance orders and possibly more coming against the federal government. Uh, now this legal strategy, accompanied with all the children and other people in terms of a social movement to bring attention to these inequalities and not normalize them anymore, that's resulted in over 250,000 services and products going to First Nations kids that they otherwise wouldn't have. But I'm not after partial equality. I'm after full equity. And that's why if people are listening to me, they'll find in news things that I'm never, quote, satisfied. Because I think that First Nations kids are worth the money. And I think that they deserve every opportunity uh, that other children in Canada already get. And part of colonialism is getting us satisfied with getting less. And I don't think, I think that these kids deserve everything uh, that everyone else gets. So no incremental equality for me, and I'm going to keep out, uh, keep calling out discrimination whenever I see it. Absolutely, and I don't like diving too much into work-related things on <laughs> on these segments, but it's definitely it's so frustrating to watch whoever because it has been decades and decades of inequality. Whoever is in power to constantly use all loopholes they can find commitment for five years well we know a term never lasts longer than four <laughs> like even even that in itself it's just it's like wow are we really not worth basic human rights like for me it's just so hard to wrap my head around and and it's 100 percent true we have begun or have unfortunately already normalized well we 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 got a little bit we should be thankful for at least whatever they're going to give us, which is total BS because we are valuable. And as Indigenous peoples, we have every right to be here. We have every right to have opportunity. We have every right to self-determine what we decide to do with our life. And it infuriates me when I have to stand in the house and look at a bunch of typically older white men and say, my people are dying, why can't you provide funding for it? Yeah. Why and can't you provide funding for services and resources that we, we need? It boggles my mind. And uh, there's a real danger in being patient. They ask us always to be patient. I, I saw your wonderful intervention on the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls report. The fact that the government has said, well, we'll get to that later. We, have, uh, we can't deal with that right now because we've got COVID going on. Um, they've known about this issue for decades. And they have a duty to respond. And they're choosing not to. And in that choosing not to, and we need to make sure, be clear with everyone, it is a choice. They're choosing not to, which means that more women and girls are going to be harmed and will die. And they have died in this, even a short little time that we've been, uh, since they've announced that report going thing, I've seen women who have gone missing and women who have died. So there's consequences to their choices, but there's hubris in their idea that A, they get to think that they get to set the pace of change. So they say that we're the ones, the government gets to set the pace of change, not the people who have experienced discrimination at our hands. We get to claim that space. And the other is that they almost want to define the harm that we've experienced. They want to define it in a way that means that distance is responsibility. They can pass it off to another government. The real harm was done by the previous government, uh, that we're, uh, we're different. They proclaim themselves benevolent in the administration of discrimination. 
And they want us to be thankful to them for the discrimination. And I think that we have to be clear that any level of discrimination is not something that deserves gratitude. It deserves a very clear and consistent, uh, but respectful and forceful uh, voice that says, no, we are just as valuable as you are. We deserve to exist as we wish. We are human beings and we're not gonna put up with getting less, right? And I think that that's something that we're, there's many, uh, kind of voices starting to kind of join that chorus, but it's still not strong enough. And I think it's something that, in a way, Canada has done so well. Uh, when, for, for myself, when I look at the, the timeline and what the UN Declaration, the United, uh, sorry, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People legislation went through, we saw it get shot down in senate and it and it never uh, came to be um in but if you look at what that document went through and the involvement that canada had was a, a big part was significant had wonderful contributions so why can't our own country pass legislation that we contributed to and and we have leaders that say we need to have this uh that even even in that canada has done a really good job at a hiding canadian history hiding the history of indigenous peoples and the relationship that it has to canada continues the media continues to portray us as less than it's the tina fontaine trial it's the colton bushy it's not their trial they are not they are the victims we see it continuously in, in so many ways. And even just thinking about the movies I watched as a kid, the movies we watch as children, the bad characters, what we, what we say are the bad characters are often darker, darker mm -hmm. skin, or they're of an obviously different ethnic background than the other main characters. We don't even realize how much it is ingrained in us. And I, I wanna go back a little bit and, for myself, there was kind of a, I wouldn't say an aha moment, but there was definitely a period of time, a number of years after I had graduated. And for context, I am 26, I graduated in 2011, uh, that it took three or four years before a light bulb went off and I said, huh, I've never learned, I never learned my own history. I learned mm -hmm. all about World War I or, and II and I can't tell you anything about that anymore. I read Shakespeare, I can't tell you I know I read Macbeth, but that's about all I can tell you. But it took me a long time to really realize I don't know much about myself and I'm on my homelands, my ancestors' homelands, and they're not teaching me about me. And it then develops this idea of normality that we don't see ourselves in positions of power, in positions of influence, in positions of existence almost so going going back to and again activism is such a cringy word i think to use but going back uh, i guess in time to when you really started focusing on those issues did you have like a, a aha moment or was it learning more and more and realizing more and more how for lack of better words messed up this country is towards indigenous peoples yeah, I think what, you know, as a young girl, when I was experiencing discrimination but didn't know it, um, I, my first response was, what did I do wrong? Because you get in trouble for things that you've done wrong, right? And then when I realized it was directed at everybody who's First Nations, it was, well, what did we do wrong to these people? This is how you process it. And then you realize that you didn't really do anything wrong, that it, the, it was on the other side this discrimination was coming from another place. And I just always have been in my own way struggled with that. But when I saw this discrimination happening to kids in child welfare, when I started doing that, that was enough for me. I thought, I, we need to understand why this is happening to these kids and go upstream and address the factors that are putting them at risk is what was so heartbreaking for me 
is that the youth in the group homes I was working in as a teenager were thinking it was about them too. The worst thing about racism is it gets internalized. They started to feel like they weren't good enough, that they weren't smart enough, that all these, that, you know, they were going to schools that were underfunded and they would see the other kids being more successful, but they didn't really uh, connect it back to Ottawa saying to the First Nations kids, you get far less for education than other people do. And I just thought this is enough is enough, right? Someone has to do something. But even there, I thought, I am so young. I am so uh, unconnected. There must be someone out there who's wiser than I am, who's more prepared than I am to deal with this, these inequalities in these federal services. And so I held back. I thought, well, I'll just work in my little area and try and do what I can. Um, and then a poem my aunt gave me years ago came across my desk again. And it has a, a phrase that it says, faith is knowing when you step across that place where light leads into darkness, that there's something solid to stand on or you'll be taught to fly. And I realized that I had to step across there. I mean, with all my insecurities, I got to at least try, right? And once I did that, I realized there were other people out there standing on that other side too. And that together with all of our wisdom, we could come together and tackle these inequalities that were happening. Um, and over the years, we have had to deploy a bunch of strategies because at first we relied on, uh, you know, the goodwill of the government. Um, and that clearly didn't happen. So we had to litigate against them. And, you know, you use that word activism, and I, I too cr cringe at it when people call me a, a, an activist, because for many of the reasons you are articulating. And it's so interesting, like we're in an era, and I just want to acknowledge the passing of John Lewis in the United States. What a, an icon of, hu of humanity. And they were framed to him, they use the words to describe him as a human rights leader or a civil rights leader. And that's the way I would see someone like you, like you're a human rights leader. It's not, uh, activist is a word that we often use to say, well, they're uh, almost like a political lobbyist <laughs> versus someone who's really working in a way that really draws our attention to fundamental injustices in our society that if we all address, will uplift all of humanity, right? How can Canada ever ha say go to the international stage and criticize other people's human rights strategies when it's uh, got an Indian Act that puts people on reserve and it's uh, racially discriminating against kids in ways that lead to their deaths and their unnecessary family separations, right? That's the disconnect that we have to make clear and present for Canadians so that they demand better of their government. Absolutely, and and I want to go. Um, I'm just ever since I started this job, I could be in the middle of a thought or doing something and I completely lose it. And sometimes it doesn't come back. Sometimes it does. And I had it right there. And now it's gone. So I'm going to go to the next question I was I was thinking about. Um, in terms of <laughs> moving forward i don't even know if that's the right term to use but in in terms of legislation and what we have seen the federal government do uh, i think that the jordan's principle was something that not very many people at the time realized the impact that that could have the change that that can make can you can you talk to us a little bit about the jordan's principle for people that are unaware of it and how that has created change and if you've seen it create more challenges than then what have what what are your thoughts on the jordan's principle well jordan's principle is named in memory of jordan river anderson from norway house Cree nation a little boy who spent over two and a half years unnecessarily in hospital because the federal government and the province of manitoba were arguing over who should pay the federal government said, this is health care, and he's in Manitoba, the province should pay. The province was saying he's First Nations kid with status, so the feds should pay. Argue, argue, argue. And sadly, the uh, little Jordan passes away in the hospital before ever getting the help he needed. And he would have received that help to live in a family home had he been any other child. So we actually created uh, Jordan's principle with Jordan's family. 
And what it's about is that First Nations kids should get the public services they need when they need them, free of discrimination because they're First Nations. That's simple. It passes in the House of Commons in 2007, and then the federal government never implemented it. And so um, we actually, that's part of the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal case. And since then, um, we've had uh, the decision which said that Canada's failure to implement Jordan's principle amounted to racial discrimination. That was 2016. And the federal government still didn't implement it. So we had to have a non-compliance order in 2017, to a year later. And uh, that decision finally triggered the federal government into action. So last year, the federal government had to provide over a quarter of a million services to First Nations kids that they otherwise wouldn't have. But there's been another gift from Jordan's spirit, and that actually is to Inuit children. And uh, there's a wonderful backstory on that in that, you know, um, we filed our case, our human rights case in 2007, a hundred years before that, in 1907, a non-Indigenous doctor was working over at Indian Affairs. His name was Dr. Bryce, and he uh, looked at the health care of kids in residential schools, and he found they were dying at a rate of 25%, and he tied those deaths to the inequitable health care that Indian children were receiving and the poor health conditions in the schools. And he told the Canadian government, you could save a lot of these kids if you just even out the health care funding and put in practical reforms. Government didn't do it. But he never stopped speaking out and he was punished by the federal government for doing it. So he's one of the great reconciliation heroes and he's buried near us in Beechwood Cemetery. But part of the, the story that people don't know is that he actually had Inuit grandchildren. And those Inuit grandchildren went to residential schools. And so uh, it was really thanks to kind of that history coming back where we're able to weave it back to Jordan's principle because those families deserved the same types of uh, healthcare services because similarly their funded healthcare for Inuit is done through First Nations and Inuit Health Branch. And it made no sense to alleviate discrimination for First Nations kids and continue to pile it on for Inuit kids. So in that way, Jordan's spirit was able to breathe a little bit of life uh, and join the spirits of Inuit ancestors and advocates and bring some, a little bit of relief but we're not there yet. We have more to do on Jordan's principle to make it less red tape for families and to make sure all children benefit from it in a way that really uh, Jordan's spirit would have us do. Fighting with the mute button over here. Absolutely. And I think for, for listeners and viewers, just to put things into context, could you imagine your child not being provided health care that keeps them alive? for years to have your child pass away and to continue to be fighting with the federal government and having a group of people of support and well-intentioned to continue to fight for years and years and years for your child that has already passed away. That is heartbreaking. Where else are we having this discussion at this level in Canada? Why are we having children die? I think, I, I don't, I don't know why pe more people aren't so angry and upset. I don't, I could cry thinking about it. Like these are lives, these are kids, these are kids that haven't had the time to fully get to the potential that they could have if they were provided services to keep them alive. Like. It boggles my mind. And you really hit it boggles on it. my mind. You know, the, the Jordan didn't get the help he needed because of his race. It wasn't because his family didn't care. It wasn't because uh, the equipment wasn't available. It wasn't because healthcare providers weren't on side. It was because of his race. And if we decided today in Canada, God forbid, that a particular other race of people is not going to get the same level of care because uh, they're not worth the money, then the injustice of that would be very clear to people. And yet we're living in that reality. We are so here. Normalized it, yeah. right? And so things that we criticize Trump for, for example, 
are actually happening here. We are unnecessarily separating families from their children because of their race and because we don't think they're worth the money in child welfare. And we have had to litigate for now 14 years to try and remedy that, litigate against them. And even that, court orders haven't been enough. That tells you how much baked into the Canadian government DNA racism is, right? And they are not aware of it, in my view. Most of the members of parliament are not aware of it. They actually think, uh, um, and they don't, when they talk about the Indian Act, it doesn't send a shiver up their spine, right? The or, Indian Act is legal. It's a it's legalizing racism it's a document that legalizes racism that the federal government uses like and and i've definitely taken sections of the indian act and i've sent them to colleagues and i'm like this is real this is really legislation and they're like what on earth is going on why is this here and i'm like yes 2020 this is here can you talk to some of the things that are in the indian act that still affect people day in day out i think one of the biggest ones for me this was really weird for me to think of uh reapplying for status every five years <laughs> to continue to so i i'm gonna take this one because this one boggles my mind so as a first nations individual to be recognized by the federal government you need to reapply for your status every five years According to the feds, at some point you stop becoming First Nations and stop deserving access to those services that come along with that status. Where, how that <laughs> works and, and continues, it, it just, I couldn't imagine. I have a, a beneficiary card. I have a number to say I'm a part of the Nunavut Land Claim Agreement beneficiary program, I think is the word. Um, but I'm a, I'm a recognized Inuk according to the government of Nunavut but I couldn't imagine but that stays with me my whole life I couldn't imagine I need to reapply and prove I'm Inuk every five years like <laughs> boggles my mind and that's just one aspect to the whole whole thing so can you talk a little bit to some of the some of the items within the Indian Act that are still present here we are talking on July 29th 2020 um, that are still very present uh, unfortunately in in today's day and age yeah so this is one of the oldest pieces of legislation in canadian history it was actually the act that allowed for the forceful removal of quote indian children in their placement in residential schools so the very fact that that very act is still with us should cause alarms for people right um but it actually deals with everything right from the moment you're born to your death so you talked about that status thing. I find it really offensive. I am a status Indian, per se. Um, and what Canada does when a First Nations baby is born is really judge whether they're status or non-status. The Canadian government makes that decision. Not the family, not the community. The Canadian government makes these decisions. And if they think you, uh, you fit within the status decision, which is heavily weighted on blood quantum, if you fit that decision, then they can give you a status card. But when you look at what it means in the Indian Act, it's actually making you a ward of the government of Canada. That's what those cards are. And um, so they are really, they were used to inform South African apartheid, that in the reserve system. And those cards are still with us. So that happens at, uh, when you're born. The other thing it does is it creates reserves. So think about it if we had a white reserve in Canada. All of a sudden we got a government said, we're gonna set up all these white reserves. It wouldn't go over too well and rightly so. But this is what happened to First Nations. You take away their land and you shove them on these reserves, often uh, land that couldn't be used for their traditional lifestyle. So it disrupted that. So we still have reserves today. And we also have band council government. And that was actually when, um, when colonialism happened, many of our communities were actually matriarchal. In, in the way I put it simply is, uh, for thousands of years, our ancestors knew men wanted the power, but women should control it. 
So <laughs> we were very matriarchal. And uh, they came by, and the Indian Act really puts, uh, put on a patriarchal uh, band council system. For many years, women couldn't sit on band councils or be chiefs. That has since changed, but the band council system would displace our traditional forms of government. The other thing that a lot of people don't realize is even if when you die, the Indian Act has some effect. So you know how we can create wills? It's become a lot, people have been talking a lot about how to will their estates. Um, you can do that as a First Nations person, but the Minister of Indian Affairs can override your will. And so if you willed a particular piece of land, for example, to your uh, children, the minister can say, well, we want that land for the government. So we're gonna override that will and we're gonna take that land. Um, the other things that it kind of uh, lo looks at is resources and ownership. So you don't own your land on reserve. It's held in trust for the crown which means the government, right? Um, and until recently, you didn't even own things on reserve. If I had a cow on reserve and I wanted to sell that cow, I actually would be in some ways in contravention of the act because the, act, the cow belonged to the queen, not to me as a First Nations person. So this act is so crazy and it's on the books. And importantly, people need to know there was a solution to get rid of this thing in 1996 called the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. And it provided a 20 year map out of the Indian Act and Canadian governments never followed it. And therefore we're still stuck with this act. I mean, the very fact we have a Department of Indigenous Services or Indigenous Crown Relations really worries me, right? Because it's like, can you imagine any, if we subbed out that word indigenous and put another racial group and that the government has a whole uh, architecture of law, of policy to control that particular group. Like it would be offensive. Yeah, but there it is, Department of Indian Affairs or Department of Indigenous Services, no matter what they change their mind to, they are the ones that are given authority through the Indian Act. Absolutely, I had no idea about that, the land piece. There's still, I still have a ton of learning to do, uh, definitely, and and that's, the other thing, I, I, I want to shift focus a little bit to, you had mentioned blood quantum, I think yeah. is something that it's so, it, it's such a difficult conversation sometimes because we, in this society, we do measure a lot of things. And I think we unmeasure unnecessarily sometimes. I would say I'm, I'm Inuk and a lot of people don't know or don't realize I'm half white. I'm half Danish. My mom's Danish, and uh, so I'm I'm half Inuk if we look at blood quantum. But I would I'm still Inuk. I'm still that's still who I am. It's still my culture. It's still the people that I am a part of. I be, I belong to them. They belong to me. It's still it's it's my people. Um, but I think that that's something that is an incredibly difficult conversation sometimes, especially for First Nations groups. And to me, I think that's the historical aspect of experiencing legal racism for a longer amount of time. And I think in within Southern Canada, that that relation, and again, I don't like that word, that relation between First Nations Indigenous groups in the South uh, and the federal government compared to the North is, is different. Um, I think that First Nations groups often experience more decades of longer, more, in, in some cases, more intense legal racism. Um, but can you talk a little bit to, I, I think, why don't we start with blood quantum and how that unfortunately is being used to measure people and even amongst ourselves i find that that's a conversation that we have often i have lots of half white friends half you know half white friends but they look more like their white side so i wouldn't look at them and necessarily say if i didn't know them oh that's an inuk yeah. but that doesn't make them any less inuk than me if i looked more like my white mom then i'd be in the same situation but i look like my inuk dad so people look at me, I say I'm Inuk and I have the tattoos and all. So they're like, oh, right, she is. And then they look at someone else who is Inuk, just as Inuk as me, if not more, because they speak the language or whatever it may be, that we're measuring even Indigenous people's 
amongst ourselves. And oftentimes blood quantum has been used as a weapon for not having access to services or not being whatever of who you are enough. And um, can you just touch on how that, um, how you've seen that affect individuals? Has that affected you in, in any way? Oh yeah, like, I mean, there's one of the, one of the most devastating outcrops of colonialism in my view is this who's a real Indian game, right? Where um, these status cards started to be associated with, oh, well, you've got a status card, so you're somehow more indigenous than somebody who's not. Uh, or you speak the language or you grew up on reserve. It's endless. Um, and it's, it's unhealthy. Because when I think of, when I roll the tape back, um, I don't know um, of a First Nation that defined membership by blood quantum historically, traditionally. Uh, in fact, we had things like custom adoptions where we would adopt people from other nations into our communities. Uh, and they became members. They were just like members as everybody else. And that's the way that things went. So I think it's, it is part of the colonial conversation that we need to have about identity is far more than blood quantum. And the other thing that doesn't happen, it's interesting, when I, uh, sometimes I've uh, looked at the House of Commons and I thought, what if we applied this status, non-status blood quantum thing to the members in the House and said that, okay, Everyone who can prove 50% blood quantum back to the original boat of Vikings, because they were here before the French and the British, the French or the British, back to those 50%, then those are status Canadians. Everybody else is non-status Canadian, right? Like somehow we have these conversations about what seems right for uh, indigenous peoples, we get in, in there without thinking how outrageous it would be if we applied it on the other side, right? And yet that's what the government does. Officially, the Department of Indian Affairs will say to you, we don't do blood quantum. But if you look at the way they define status, it's based on if you and your, your parents have status, they can pass it down to you. But if your parent marries someone who doesn't have status, then that status becomes diluted, right? So it's just cover for what really is in uh, blood quantum. And we need, this is exactly the system that we protested against in apartheid South Africa. Yet it continues here, right? It continues here. And we need to, within our communities, have those courageous conversations uh, to say, look, are we, um, are we the carriers of colonialism amongst ourselves? Or are we going to be the carriers of those ancestral teachings that have really served us so well over multiple generations? And if it's the serving of the ancestral teachings, then there are certain practices that we need to do away with. And one of them is this ridiculous reliance on blood quantum when it comes to respecting the identity of one another. And I think that's something, where else are we, where, where else are we seeing around even the world where we're having that discussion on politicizing identity? Yeah. That's what it is. It's, it's political, it's politics defining what you do or don't identify as in such a messed up way. <laughs> yeah, and, and I always believe that, you know, it's a, a Indigenous identity or First Nations identity, as I see it, is not only how you identify, but your recognition by your community, right? So when I go home, they know who I am, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they take me with all my, all my imperfections. Uh, um, and that's, that's the piece is because it is a relational culture. So there's that accountability in a community as well. Absolutely. And um, for beneficiary status um, to be recognized as Inuk, uh, you can apply for that. And there are committees, there are councils in, at least in Nunavut, in, in communities that determine whether or not they're going to say yes. Yeah. Uh, I've gotten into friendly, conver friendly debates with people from my hometown, of people that really thought my mom's Inuk. And I say, no, she, she's white. She's she she is <laughs> and um some people just simply don't believe me it's it's kind of funny but it's it is it's it's definitely once you're and it even that is such an interesting conversation but you had touched on 
you know, adopting from other First Nations groups. That's definitely, adoption is, is such a normal thing in the North. Um, we call, you know, I have a niece, we call her Digwak. It translates to the one that was adopted. Oh. We call her the adopted one. Like they know growing up, they know who their biological parents are and, and who their parents are and, and whatnot. It's something that is very different from, you know, uh, even watching a show the other day, it was like, oh, we're going to tell our daughter when she's 18, we need to have the big conversation. And for us, it's like, no, they've known since they can walk who, who it is. Um, but I, I do want to talk about um, that, that history. And you had touched on, um, again, the Indian Act legalizing racism, um, where if a woman for a period of time in certain areas in, in the South, where if a woman had married a non First Nations man, uh, that she would lose status. I know friends that, uh, I have friends that aren't recognized by the federal government through the Indian Act because of that. And to not be able to have those programs and, and services that come along with it um, because of something that was racist 50, 60 years ago and, and uh, you know, in, within those decades. Can you talk a little bit to how, how that legislation impacts individuals in, in terms of services and programs if you are not a recognized status Indian? Right. Um, the first thing I'd say is the Indian Act needs to go because I don't think anyone should have to be a ward of the government to receive services. That is really key. Yes. That doesn't apply to anybody else, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that needs to go. Um, but in terms of uh, accessing some of those services, um, there's a real shortage, I think we can all agree, among First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples for culturally based services. And sometimes there's specific programs that are targeted to First Nations populations, things like healthcare. Um, it could be, um, things like being recognized when the land claim comes along, right? Because that's one of the reasons why the Canadian government wants to control that definition of status Indians is because that's who they say they have uh, land title uh, obligations for. So when they settle something with a land title obligation, they're only factoring in that population of uh, status Indians that they control for. So that's a huge thing, right? Um, and uh, there's also like, particular uh, sometimes particular educational programs that are targeted to status Indian kids. So it really is a demarcation that the federal government says is if you don't meet our blood quantum criteria you're out. If you do meet our blood quantum criteria you're in but you're a ward of our government as an exchange and that just seems to me to be a, a, a Faustian bargain, right? Uh, th that there should be recognition on the basis of identity and people should be able to access services on the basis of that, not on the basis of this status, non-status stuff. Absolutely. And it's so just, I can't, most days I really, I just have a floating question mark above my head that you can't see. Uh, and you had touched on, we have been talking a lot about history and I think, and, and I'm wondering, this out loud for Inuit we're very oral very oral history uh even uh you know the syllabics the symbols for Inuktitut that's not that's not from Inuit it was an adoption from I believe Cree which I believe even that might have been forced written language onto them um so when you look at the symbols they're very very similar because that's what the Canadian government to my knowledge anyways, um, had decided to to adopt. And we we hear and, and see stories a lot in relation to Inuit and, and history and Canadian history. I think the most recent one, TikTok, is a, it's a big thing. I haven't gotten into it yet. But I'd seen a video circulating very, very widely. And it looks like a white youth, I can't even say kid, it's a, it's an older individual, who's talking about the ships near Joe Haven, the Franklin ships, and mm -hmm. is giving you know, these, these facts. But really what it is, is written white history that does not take into account 
oral Inuit history. The Franklin ships were discovered in 2014. You ask an Inuk there, <laughs> the place is legitimately called where the ships are and have been called that for years and years and years. All you had to do was say, hello Inuit, do you know of something you want to tell us about? <laughs> like it's, and, it, and, and even that conversation, um, there's a lot of individuals from that community that don't want those ships touched. There, there, it is very much um, a part of Inuit beliefs, if you will, that we don't, you don't touch things that, like I was told growing up, you don't touch bones that are out on the land. They're to go back to the land. You, you leave them if they're already there and bare. Um, you know, and, and it doesn't take into consideration that oral history, because when you, when you talk to Inuit, when you talk to people that have that knowledge that has been passed down through either community or family, what you hear most often is that Inuit took in settlers or e explorers or discoverers, whatever weird word you want to use, um, for that. And most often what you hear is that Inuit helped to the best of their ability with those individuals. Those individuals would not have survived without Inuit. You also hear of, uh, there are half black, half Inuk families because, you know, whalers came up before the government. And, and there's the whole, there's a whole piece of history we are missing because we don't recognize and value oral history as much as we do written in Canada. And the written history is written by white people that in, uh, take John A. Macdonald, for example, super racist, yeah. first prime minister of Canada, uh, believed that basically the Indian should be, should cease to exist. The culture, the practices, the traditions should no longer be. And these are the individuals that continue to carry on in some way, shape, or form, those ideations of we don't value what you are bringing forward as much as what we think is right or, or best or most valuable. That even those perceptions of value, of belief, of contribution is so significantly unbalanced and one-sided. The power imbalance is huge. Is there anything um, similar to that in terms of recognizing history and telling real history and telling all sides of history that you find that you have experienced or, or seen. Um, absolutely. I think there's a lot of parallel experiences, but I, I, I guess I would take a little bit of a, a step and say that really what it's about, it, it gets back to that dichotomy of colonialism where everything First Nations, Métis or Inuit, was considered savage. And everything that was European was considered civilized. And that included knowledge. So it wasn't just, and I think this is where people make the mistake, when they hear the word history with oral, they think it's about events of the past. And it can be about that. But it's actually about the expression of science. It's about the expression of architecture. It's about the expression of geography. It's about the expression of literature, of the arts, of humanity. It is a knowledge system that's not in the past. It is in the present, carried like by people like yourself, by others in your community. And within that knowledge system are some of the answers that are absolutely key to uh, dealing with today's challenges. Uh, climate change, for example. For uh, First Nations, climate change is weird because we don't think of the, the climate as a threat to us. Uh, we are part of the world. We are part of the climate. And so we have a different relational perspective, but knowledge that can be used uh, if treated respectfully to address climate change. Peace building. So if you look at the Iroquois Confederacy, right, and how they were used as a model for the United Nations and later for the United States in terms of democracy. That idea of peace building, there's many peace building traditions amongst Indigenous peoples that could thread and help solve some of the world's worldwide conflicts that have been going on for ages. There's so much knowledge in there. And as a First Nations kid, when I was growing up in a bush, 
I kind of had uh, for uh, a traditional upbringing until I was five, education, right? And really, if I was to break it down, I'd say I was taught that the most important things about being a human being and living in relationship to the land and to others, um, an elder could tell me as a four-year-old and I would understand it, but it would, I'd have to see it through different lenses of my life and hear the experiences of others to come close to a better understanding of what that meant and how to express it. But when I went to grade one, I was compl uh, in Western edu education, I was convinced I was stupid. I thought, this is it for me, I'm done. And then I finally realized, I realized that you were smart in Western education to the degree that no one else understood you. That all the way through your PhD, you're gonna publish a paper that only three other people will have to read and they'll have to be paid to read it. And so versus in our teachings, in many of our teachings, it was let's explore these fundamental things that we know about living as a, as a person and in respect for our ancestors and thinking forward for the future generations in an interconnected world. Let's think about all of these things as, uh, and be able to have conversations from the earliest ages and throughout, the, throughout your lifetime so that we're reminded whenever we deal with the world of complexity that we have to come back to this basic compass that'll guide us forward, that guided people before us forward. And if we pay attention to that longitudinal study, to use the Western world, in terms of this passage of knowledge through our generations, it has within its core the ability for us to resolve contemporary issues in ways that can bring harmony for generations who will follow us. And I think that that's, that's really uh, a lost opportunity now. Uh, even in government, I hear them talking to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit about capacity building. And that means usually capacity building for the Indigenous community over to Western ways of knowing. But the, they have not understood the, what they have to learn from Indigenous peoples in this country. The value of the scientific knowledge, the artistic knowledge, the human knowledge, the political knowledge, the economic knowledge, knowledges in all those areas that could inform a different way of existing as a country and indeed globally. I'm just making notes. I'm going to use some of these. I love, I love talking about how we talk. I think it's something that it's, it's extremely important. I'm very picky. For example, about Indigenous communities. I say majority Indigenous communities because it is not only Indigenous peoples there. And mm -hmm. to say that, I think it ignores oh, a ton of things. It ignores uh, so many things. I'm, I won't dive into that. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the, that that perception of things are black and white. Yeah. As 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 a woman as an indigenous person as an inuk my whole as 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 half inuk half white my whole life is gray there is no such thing i believe there is no such thing for me as black and white it's not and there are definitely things that are so i take that back there are, there are some key things to me that are black and white but for the most part my world is gray my my world is something that doesn't make sense because it has been built not to and i think that for example even and and you had touched on it towards the beginning in our in this day and age when we use words like traditional to me that doesn't look at the historical wrongdoings that the federal government did and continues to do uh to me that it, it erases that the fact that as indigenous peoples it was put into law that we were not to practice our culture we are not to uh, continue wearing regalia wearing headdresses for us it was things like shamanism and, and face tattoo tattooing in general uh, so and and people kind of have this weird and I'd be really interested to know what your experience is. For, for myself, people legitimately sometimes wish I could just hand them a handbook. Here are the five things that you do to reach reconciliation. Yeah. And I, 
get questions all the time on things and I'm like I'm not a Google search bar you can Google that like I'm, I'm not here to just and again like we are constantly trying or it feels like we are just trying to win some weird argument in justifying why our lives are just as valuable just as important we deserve basic human rights equal opportunity and the right to self-determination so can can you talk about some of those um i guess like assumptions that people have where they really want you to put things into black and white and it's it's so gray sometimes it's hard to talk about things like well even education i think is one that's an interesting conversation because we're talking about having a, a balance of what Western society thinks is educating and, and learning and things that we should know. Uh, and for many indigenous groups, it's a very, very holistic view. It's a very, and, and it's learning at your own pace and it's not grading or saying by five, you should know all your colors, ABCs, one, two, threes kind of thing. Um, it's it's a much in my view better approach with <laughs> word word we because when we look at teachings through indigenous peoples it's oftentimes at the child's pace it's giving children more responsibility more respect including them uh instead of saying oh you're too it's too young to what like it it just seems so many conversations that we have are very they're too simple. They're too black and white. We're not talking about the gray. And for Indigenous peoples within Canada, that's it's our life. Our life is gray a lot of the time. And and I only say that to mean that it's it's a blend. It's a mix. There is no right, wrong, yes or no. Oftentimes, those conversations should actually be the in between areas that we don't talk about. Can you talk to some of those in between areas or? Uh, even examples of of people saying well isn't it just that or this why can't we just do one or the other kind of thing uh, can you talk about some of your gray experiences yeah i think it's really interesting is that uh one of my friends uh terry cross who's a native american uh thinker uh works a lot with uh, native american children and families he talks about the difference between abundance and scarcity in worldviews so things like um, uh, equality, uh, things like freedom, things like rights. Um, do we enter into this, that conversation thinking that there's a scarcity of those things? So if you have your rights recognized, that, I mean, does that mean that I get less, i.e. there's a finite amount of rights, of freedom and equality in the world? Um, or do we take the view that there's abundance, that there's enough for everyone? And the issue isn't the resources or the scarcity thereof, it's our relationship to them. And I think Indigenous peoples in general take the view that there's an abundance, that there isn't a trade-off in this, that you can be free and I can be free, you can be equal and I can be equal. And equality doesn't mean sameness, it means we have the ability to live distinctly as who we are. So I think that, you know, when we talk about um, this thing with, with broader Canadians, sometimes they get into that view that it's a trade-off. Somehow they're going to have to give something up in order for Indigenous peoples to have the basic human rights that we've been talking about. But that's not it. That's not the way it works, right? Is that rights are only rights when they're afforded to everyone. And with rights come responsibilities. If I have a right that's observed, my responsibility is towards other persons who are not receiving that right, right? I, I, we, there are basic fundamental values that are involved in this. So I think that's one area where people get it wrong, is they look at it black and white, when really it is about what kind of world do we want to raise our kids in? Is it one where every kid matters, or is it one where only one, some kids matter, keeping in mind that you might put, be in that group for now, but in the next generation, your kids might be out of that group, okay? Is that the kind of world we want? Well, you, we need to ask those questions. And what I would say to non-Indigenous folks is a, is a couple of things. One is that what we're looking for are partners to address contemporary injustices. 
And part of that partnership is embracing your own responsibility to learn about your country. And, it's, and uh, we're not just expecting you to start from scratch. There's reports like the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. There is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There is the Murdered Missing Indigenous Women and Girls Report. And um, if you're able to kind of get some bedrock on the history of the country, then we have a place for that conversation to happen. But if you're always relying on us to teach you about the basic history, then we can't get to a space where we can have the conversations about the gray, <laughs> right? And um, that's not going to move us collectively forward. And so there is that responsibility. The other thing that I have done at the Caring Society is to try and take those grays and make them a bit more black and white. So with um, the Caring Society, we have seven free ways for people of any diversity to make a difference for First Nations kids in under two minutes. And there are ways that have been defined by First Nations communities. But what I um, realized years uh, ago is that I wasn't framing them in a way that people could understand them. I was using language like in grade one where you, only a few people understood. When what I really wanted was language that everybody could understand, right? So I started to read George Lakoff's work on Don't Think of an Elephant, a book that I recommend to everybody. It's, it's pretty cheap to get from paperback from your bookseller or um, going on to frameworks.org and realizing, thinking more about how things need to be framed, thinking more about how elders frame this. Like Elmer Crochane, a respected elder uh, from Saguin First Nation in Manitoba, someone who is a mentor to me, he would always call it loving justice. That was his word that was the closest, a phrase closest to reconciliation. He called it loving justice. And when you think about loving justice for children, that's something that everyone can kind of relate to, right? But somehow we come up with these words, these, these, these words that seem pretty abstract and, well, how, what does this actually mean? And how do we get into this? But if we go back to explaining things simply, sometimes those simple explanations bring us closer to the real human spirit that we need to evoke. So framing, self-educating and ensuring that then you're now in a position as a non-indigenous person to have conversations that are in those areas of fluidity and gray and don't try to get us in a place where we all have to think one way in order for there to be progress i find that amazing in government you probably see it in the house of commons all the time well the first nations don't agree so we can't do anything and they're they're sitting in the house of commons for pete's sake where you got a uh, largely mostly white folks who don't agree and yet they're somehow able to move the ball forward, right? Sometimes pretty clumsily so, but they, they expect things of us that they would never expect of themselves. Absolutely, and, and that's um, hopefully, one day I'm gonna roll my eyes so far back, they're gonna get stuck in the back of my head. Yeah. Um, that is definitely what, exactly what happens in the House of Commons um, where, yeah, absolutely. And you don't have to, look far to to see those kinds of things happening we look at what's what and we look at the pipeline the divisiveness that is being created uh within that because of political involvement and it's a such a layered and and in some ways a really complex conversation but really what we're looking at is we're giving large groups of indigenous peoples an impossible choice yeah. This is opportunity for a job, which means money, which means being able to feed your kids and pay rent. How are, how are we going to provide an option between natural resource extraction and being able to provide for yourself and your family? It's an impossible choice. We, we, we pick who we love first. And that's just one example. And there are huge ones, there are small ones, and, and we see them all, all, all too often. What I think colonialism does is it brings it down to those dichotomous choices. Right. Right. So for everyone else who's actually had a properly funded education that was uh, reflected and honored who they were, where their material was reflective of, of them and their family, where there wasn't the underfunding of services like water or the unbelievable high food prices paid in the northern communities were 33 bucks for a thing of orange juice, where everyone without those experiences uh, 
is able to have a broader array of choices. Whereas for colonialism, it's constructed in a way that you either uh, get involved in resource development somehow, or you don't and you preserve your culture and no one else has to make that choice. That is a part of one of the biggest symbols of colonialism. It's one of the, the red flags of colonialism when people only have those two choices to choose from. It's not a choice. It's not, it's, it, it really, oh, I can dive into a whole thing about <laughs> that. But uh, you had mentioned uh, a, a couple of times now since we've been talking properly funded education. Can you expand on that? I think that's one of the biggest stereotypes that is out there is that, oh, you're indigenous, you got paid to go to school. You got, you got paid for your education. What are you whining about? What are you talking about? Inequality. The government just hands you things. I think that is one of the biggest misconceptions, at least that I have seen and experienced in my, in my life. Can you talk about what you mean by properly funded education? So we mentioned before that the federal government funds all public services on reserve, that includes education. And uh, it includes the schools. And what we know from the parliamentary budget officer, the auditor general and others is that it's significantly underfunded, uh, as much as half of what uh, other schools would get. And one of the people who I think said this the best is uh, the respected and much missed uh, First Nations education, human rights, uh, leaders, Shannon Kustachin, who is from the Attawapiskat First Nation. And uh, her school uh, was built on top of a diesel fuel lung, uh, leak. 30,000 gallons of diesel was below her school. And it was making people sick. So they closed the school the Government of Canada. Then they brought portable trailers up to James Bay and put them on the playground of that contaminated school. They told the kids this is only temporary, but Janet, uh, Shannon went from kindergarten to grade eight in those same portables and they got more and more run down. There was ice buildup on the insides, there was rodent infestations, there was no hallways in the school, it would be regularly minus 40 outside so you had to bundle up to go to your next class. And as Shannon said, kids were losing hope at grade four and dropping out. So she wanted to do something about it because she said, school's a time for dreams and every kid deserves this. And she saw the leadership of her community pleading with Canada for a school, but that wasn't enough to convince the Canadian government. So she got a YouTube video and she went around her, uh, the, the portables and took pictures of them and sent out a YouTube video inviting non-Indigenous kids to join her in the fight for a proper school. And they did, they started to send letters. In fact, more letters arrived at Indian Affairs thanks to Shannon Kustachin's leadership and the leadership of other youth in Attawapiskat than ever before on any issue. Um, but that, even that wasn't enough pressure. So she come, what they do is, uh, Shannon's about to graduate from grade eight and they cancel their, they had fundraised for a grade eight graduation, but they canceled their grade eight graduation, used the money to send Shannon and two other youth from Attawapiskat down to meet with the Minister of Indian Affairs. To she demand grade school. eight. Grade eight. Grade eight. Wow. So she flies to Ottawa and she's meeting with the Minister of Indian Affairs. And he's looking at, a, you know, doing whatever he's doing, pointing out how big his office is. And she said, yeah, I wish our school was as nice as your office. And she, and she said, are you gonna give us a school or not? And he said, no, we can't afford it. And she said, I don't believe you. And school's a time for dreams and every kid deserves this and I will never give up. And true to her word, she kept on telling everyone around Canada and indeed around the world about the inequities and the hardships and what that meant for First Nations students. And sadly, when she was 13, she wanted to go to uh, university to be a human rights lawyer for the education rights. So she knew she couldn't go to the underfunded high school in her community and be able to go to university. So she goes hundreds of miles away to a school in New Lister. And it was on her way back to school one day where she was killed in an automobile accident at the age of 15. She never saw the school that eventually was built in Attawapiskat, and she, uh, kids like her are still fighting for equity in education.
because they want to grow up and be someone important and also be who they are. They shouldn't have to sacrifice who they are in that process. So yeah, Shannon's dream is still unfulfilled by the Canadian government. Still. And it's, I hope that with how much we have access to everything going on in the moment right now, <laughs> I think it's, it's a little bit much how, I think, what's the saying, 10, 10 seconds of fame or something like that. I think we're down to one or half a second of very important topics that just come and go so quickly. And I, I really hope we're at a turning point in Canada where because we have access to even these kinds of conversations that we're starting to have more support and more people willing to walk alongside us, more people willing to step forward because what, what we are seeing, and you know, I, I think of uh, now individuals like Autumn who travels internationally advocating for for water, for right to water, that we are having youth looking around and saying, these grown-ups aren't taking care of what they need to. They're not taking care of us. I, I now feel the need to, to step in and, and use my voice. And it's something that is incredibly powerful. But I hope it is also a realization for Canadians to say, holy, why aren't we supporting individuals in basic human rights, in equality, in justice. And, and I think that's a turning point that we're starting to see more so. But we are also seeing all of the, the negativity and, and the trolling and the, you, it, if you ever question, if you ever, ever question whether there is racism in Canada or not, all you need to do is go on Facebook or Twitter yeah. or, and all you need to do is look at the comment section. We still very clearly have, have an issue with differences. And I think that unfortunately in, and, and it's still, I can't, the more, the longer I'm in this position and, and it was a quick one, it was a quick decision. If you asked me exactly a year ago, uh, if I saw myself, exactly where I am a year later, I would laugh at you and say, politics? Ew. <laughs> I don't want to be involved and leave me out of that. And then the opportunity came along and I think for, for Indigenous peoples like us, and, and I think even privilege, for there was quite a while where even saying white privilege was too much for a lot of people. And I think we're starting to get comfortable with that idea. And I think there are so many different levels of privilege. I have privilege 100%. Okay. I, I get to advocate for Inuit, for Nunavut on a federal level that, that comes along with a lot of privileges. I can do that, fortunately. <laughs> there are so many barriers, even in becoming an MP, uh, that people don't realize. And it, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly eye-opening for myself to see really how ingrained and, and the foundation of what we call Canada is built on racism, on discrimination, on the idea that one way of living is better than another or is, is higher or is, is more for whatever reason. Uh, I'm just, I'm looking at our time. I'm really, really enjoying this conversation and I don't want it to stop. But <laughs> we have been talking for yes. <laughs> quite a while and, and that's perfectly fine. I'm thinking maybe I'll, I'll chunk up this one and, and we'll put it out in segments maybe. But we'll, well see. All that means is that we get to have another conversation some, and, and yeah. then, you know. Be great. And, and just to wrap up, I think uh, to leave on a positive note, we can talk to the future and talk to what other people, how people can contribute. So for Indigenous children in looking towards the future, however far you want to look, what are some, some of the hopes that you have, some of the changes they, you would like to see? That they, the kids like Autumn and kids like Shannon no longer have to spend their childhoods fighting for clean water and, cl and a good education. That we decide as a society that enough is enough and uh, culturally based equity and public services for First Nations, Métis and Inuit children is a, is, is a of course item. I always talk about when we cross, finally at some point we're going to cross a threshold 
where that type of discrimination becomes absolutely intolerable to the Canadian consciousness. And when we're on the other side, we're going to be asking, how did we ever put up with that? And uh, I want us to remember the normalization, how much normal it was and how dangerous that was and how important it is that we don't normalize that. That's one of my dreams. And the other um, is that we enter into a society, we start dialoguing about differences as an asset instead of something that somehow creates it that is equated with trouble. That we understand that um, like our ancestors have said, that no one people, no one person had all the answers. It was in our interdependence and the way that we related to one another and to the land that really would define the levels of humanity, the best of humanity that we could achieve together. And I'd like to see First Nations, Métis and Inuit children being a valued part of that constellation, that they are valuable because of who they are. And the other thing I'd like is for them not to feel not to be playing that who's a real Indian game in their own head. They are sacred and special. That identity they have was gifted to them by something far more powerful than any human being around them. It was gifted to them by their ancestors. They feel it in their spirit and they feel it in their heart. And the, we need to honor them for who they are and embrace that. Not question it, not challenge it, not apply for status cards that that is something that's respected and honored going forward. And people can help make a difference by that seven ways to make a difference. And uh, going onto our website, fncaringsociety.com, it really is that easy. And everything is free because we won't charge people uh, who want to make a difference in society. We want you because of who you are, not because of how much you carry in your wallet. I'm just writing the website over here for myself. Oh, great. You have to take a look. Um, yes, absolutely. And I really hope that listeners and viewers are really grasping what we're talking about and that we are talking about, we are talking about equality for, for children, for kids, for youth. And uh, I, it's, it's so powerful and amazing, but at the same time, it's like, why are we here in this day and age? Yeah. fighting still fighting 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 and and it's 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 a it's amazing but it's also unfortunate in a way that it it needs to happen and yeah. i i think we are moving into a better place i think we are i think we're we're getting after talking about truth and reconciliation for for a number of years i think we're moving we're moving towards truth and i think we're we're getting there yeah. um in in some ways one Definitely, we're, we're getting there in some ways. Uh, what about yourself? What would you like to see for, for your future? What Are there some things that you hope to be able to, to do? Well, I've, I honestly feel so blessed in my lifetime already to have the opportunity to work in the company of others. And by others, I mean those who came long before I did, uh, to really try to break the chains of the racial discrimination that First Nations children are experiencing and to live long enough to start to see how when they're given an equal opportunity from Jordan's principal or uh, through Shannon's advocacy with the opening of other schools, the amazing things that are starting to unfold for those kids. What an absolute blessing. I, I would hope that we would you know, be able to see the federal government finally acknowledges racially discriminating against kids across all areas and not not talk about, oh, but we made historic investments, but actually sit with that. And then in a way that compels them into action, into ending it. Um, but I don't know if that was uh, what thing that the ancestors had plotted out for me. I just know that I've been really blessed to be a part of this journey. And I have so much faith in those young people like Autumn and others uh, to be able to carry this torch and do something even different, much more extraordinary than I can ever imagine. I just would love to see that their gifts are, are, are in ways where their fundamental human rights are already acknowledged, that they no longer have to spend their childhoods fighting for the basics because um, I just think those gifts they have are just so extraordinary and I just love to see them focused on whatever the world could, could bring to them. 
Absolutely. Hopefully in, in our lifetimes, at least we'll be able to see some of those things start to change. It would be very heartbreaking to leave the world in a place that we're in a very similar place we found it in, if that makes sense. And I think I love working with youth and that, and, and children keep you so grounded and, and humble in knowing and being reminded constantly of what the important things are in life. And that's taking care of ourselves, helping taking care of others and, and spending time supporting one another with our, with our loved ones. And jumping into mud puddles with both feet. Oh, jumping into mud puddles <laughs> with both feet. I love it. Like it's, it's such a nice, um, our, our children are so important and, and the next generations, that's why I do what I do. I can't imagine a life where my children or grandchildren or great grandchildren or great 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 grandchildren are still fighting for the same things that we're sitting here talking about and i think it's it's something that is shifting and, and changing and something that's so un empowering uh the most productive points of my life were with youth the times i grew the most the times i i fought the hardest the times i felt like oh i'm so done with with everything it was it's youth that always pulled me back and youth and and it's kind of weird i think for myself to say that out loud because i am 26 but i think for a lot of indigenous peoples unfortunately we're forced to grow up and figure things out a lot more quickly than other people would imagine which is ironic in a way when you look at the education system and when you look at the situations that we are put in. We are very <laughs> resourceful, knowledgeable, creative, because we, we have to be to an extent as well. And, and I think that providing equality and justice is just feeding into individuals, families, and communities that have such amazing co potential contributions to make for the rest of us. And just, oh, imagine a, a, a Canada like that. Imagine a Canada with equality for children to, to grow and achieve dreams that they want to, regardless of what it is. Oh, so <laughs> even just that, it's like, there's, there's hope. We have hope. We have strength. There, we'll, we'll get there. We are, uh, and you know, a huge thanks to the ancestors who came before us, because you and I would not be standing where we were if not for them. Absolutely. And um, I am, I am my my one hope is that I make a, as half a good of ancestor as they were to us. I totally agree, and totally share that same goal. I really, really appreciated all of really your time nice today. To you. It's so, so much fun. Oh, it's so, so nice to connect and. Uh, when I had asked one of my staff to see if you'd be interested, you know, I had done a little bit of research. Uh, to be very honest, I didn't know much about you until no. a couple of weeks ago. And once I started looking, I was like, oh my gosh, all this, all this power, powerful things you are working on and have worked on and uh, changing. I, I think we need to learn how to break a little bit more. We're here trying to change lives and to an extent we're getting there. And, yeah and it'll it'll get better awesome thank you so much again for your time i really really appreciate it be thank safe you. and have a good trip back home yes thank you so much bye-bye